Section 15 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 1, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Eleonora of Aquitaine, Chapter 1, Part 1. The life of the consort of Henry the Second commences the biographies of a series of Provencal princesses, with whom the earlier monarchs of our royal house of Plantagenet allied themselves for upwards of a century. Important effects, not only on the domestic history of the court of England, but on its commerce and statistics, may be traced to its union, by means of this queen, with the most polished and civilized people on the face of the earth, as the Provençals of the 12th and 13th centuries indisputably were. With the arts, the idealities, and the refinements of life, Eleonora brought acquisitions of more importance to the Anglo-Norman people, than even that great Provence tower on which Dante dwells with such earnestness. But before the sweet provinces of the south were united to England, by the marriage of their heiress to the heir of the conqueror, a very tissue of incidents had checkered the life of the Duchess of Aquitaine, and it is necessary to trace them, before we can describe her conduct as Queen of England. It would be in vain to search on a map for the dominions of Eleonora under the title of Dukedom of Aquitaine. In the 11th century, the counties of Guienne and Gascony were erected into this dukedom, after the ancient kingdom of Provence, established by a diet of Charlemagne, had been dismembered. Julius Caesar calls the south of Gaul Aquitaine, from the numerous rivers and fine ports belonging to it, and the poetical population of this district adopted the name for their dukedom from the classics. The language which prevailed all over the south of France was called Provençal, from the kingdom of Provence, and it formed a bond of national union among the numerous independent sovereigns under whose feudal sway this beautiful country was divided. Throughout the whole tract of country, from Navarre to the domains of the Dauphin of Auvergne, and from sea to sea, the Provençal language was spoken, a language which combined the best points of French and Italian, and presented peculiar facilities for poetical composition. It was called the Languedoc, sometimes Languedoc et no, the tongue of yes and no, because instead of the we oui and non of the rest of France, the affirmative and negative were ac and no. The ancestors of Eleonora were called par excellence the lords of ac and no. William the Ninth, her grandfather, was one of the earliest professors and most liberal patrons of the arts. His poems were models of imitation for all the succeeding troubadours. The descendants of this minstrel hero were Eleonora and her sister Petronella. They were the daughters of his son, William, Count of Poitou, by one of the daughters of Raymond of Toulouse. William of Poitou was a pious prince, which, together with his death in the Holy Land, caused his father's subjects to call him St. William. The mother of this prince was the great heiress, Philippa of Toulouse, Duchess of Guienne and Gascony, and Countess of Toulouse in her own right. Before Philippa married, her husband was William, the seventh Count of Poitou and saint Tone. Afterwards he called himself William the Fourth Duke of Aquitaine. He invested his eldest son with the county of Poitou, who is termed William the Tenth of Poitou. He did not live to inherit the united provinces of Poitou and Aquitaine, which comprise nearly the whole of the south of France. The rich inheritance of Toulouse, part of the dower of the Duchess Philippa, was pawned for a sum of money to the Count of St. Giles, her cousin, which enabled her husband to undertake the expense of a crusade led by Robert of Normandy. The Count of St. Giles took possession of Toulouse, and withheld it as a forfeited mortgage from Eleonora, who finally inherited her grandmother's rights to this lovely province. The father of Eleonora left Aquitaine in 1132, with his brother, Raymond of Poitou, who was chosen by the princes of the crusade that year, to receive the hand of the heiress of Conrad, Prince of Antioch, 
and maintain that bulwark of the Holy Land against the assaults of pagans and infidels. William fell, aiding his brother in this arduous contest, but Raymond succeeded in establishing himself as Prince of Antioch. The grandfather of Eleonora had been gay and even licentious in his youth, and now, at the age of sixty-eight, he wished to devote some time, before his death, to meditation and penance, for the sins of his early life. When his granddaughter had attained her fourteenth year, he commenced his career of self-denial, by summoning the baronage of Aquitaine, and communicating his intention of abdicating in favor of his granddaughter, to whom they all took the oath of allegiance. He then opened his great project of uniting Aquitaine with France, by giving Eleonora in marriage to the heir of Louis Le Gros. The barons agreed to this proposal, on condition that the laws and customs of Aquitaine should be held inviolate, and that the consent of the young princess should be obtained. Eleonora had an interview with her suitor, and professed herself pleased with the arrangement. Louis and Eleonora were immediately married with great pomp, at Bordeaux, and on the solemn resignation of Duke William, the youthful pair were crowned Duke and Duchess of Aquitaine, August 1st, 1137. On the conclusion of this grand ceremony, Duke William, grandsire of the bride, laid down his robes and insignia of sovereignty, and took up the hermit's cowl and staff. He departed on a pilgrimage to St. James's of Compostinella in Spain, and died soon after, very penitent, in one of the cells of that rocky wilderness. At the time when Duke William resigned the dominions of the South to his granddaughter, he was the most powerful prince in Europe. His rich ports of Bordeaux and saint supplied him with commercial wealth. His maritime power was immense. His court was the focus of learning and luxury and it must be owned, that at the ascension of the fair Eleonora, this court had become not a little licentious. Louis and his bride obtained immediate possession of Poitou, Gascony, Biscay, and a large territory extending beyond the Pyrenees. They repaired afterwards to Poitiers, where Louis was solemnly crowned Duke of Guienne. Scarcely was this ceremony concluded, when Eleonora and her husband were summoned to the deathbed of Louis the Sixth that admirable king and lawgiver of France. His dying words were, Remember, royalty is a public trust, for the exercise of which a rigorous account will be exacted by him, who has the sole disposal of crowns and scepters. So spoke the great legislator of France, to the youthful pair whose wedlock had united the north and south of France. On the conscientious mind of Louis the Seventh the words of his dying father were strongly impressed. But it was late in life before his thoughtless partner profited by them. Eleonora was very beautiful. She had been reared in all accomplishments of the South. She was a fine musician, and composed and sang the chansons and tensons of Provençal poetry. Her native troubadours expressly inform us that she could both read and write. The government of her dominions was in her own hands, and she frequently resided in her native capital of Bordeaux. She was perfectly adored by her southern subjects, who always welcomed her with joy, and they bitterly mourned her absence, when she was obliged to return to her court at Paris, a court whose morals were severe, where the rigid rule of St. Bernard was observed by the king her husband, as if his palace had been a convent. Far different was the rule of Eleonora in the cities of the south. The political sovereignty of her native dominions was not the only authority exercised by Eleonora in Gay Guienne. She was, by hereditary rights, chief reviewer and critic of the poets of Provence. At certain festivals held by her, after the custom of her ancestors, called Courts of Love, all new servants and chassons, were sung or recited before her by the troubadours. She then, assisted by a conclave of her ladies, sat in judgment, and pronounced sentence on their literary merits. She was herself a popular troubadour poet. Her chansons were remembered, long after death had raised a barrier against flattery, and she is reckoned among the authors of France. The amusements of the young queen of France seemed little suited to the austere habits of Louis the Seventh yet she had the power of influencing him to commit the only act of willful injustice which stains the annals of his reign 
the sister of the queen the young petronilla whose beauty equalled that of her sister and whose levity far surpassed it could find no single man in all of france to bewitch with the spell of her fascinations but chose to seduce rodolphe count of vermandois from his wife this prince who was cousin and prime minister to louis the seventh had married a sister of the count of champagne whom he divorced for some frivolous pretext and married the fair petronella by contrivance of eleonora the count of champagne laid his sister's wrongs before the pope who commanded vermandois to put away petronella and to take back the injured sister of champagne queen eleonora enraged at the dishonor of petronella prevailed on her husband to punish the count of champagne for his interference louis who already had cause of offence against the count invaded champagne at the head of a large army and began a devastating war in the course of which a most dreadful occurrence happened at the storming of vitry the cathedral wherein thirteen hundred persons had taken refuge was burnt and the poor people perished miserably it was at this juncture that saint bernard preached the crusade at Vézelay in burgundy king louis and queen eleonora with all their court came to hear the eloquent saint and such crowds attended the royal auditors that saint bernard was forced to preach in the market-place for no cathedral however large could contain them saint bernard touched with so much eloquence on the murderous conflagration at vitry that the heart of the pious king louis full of penitence for the sad effects of his destructiveness on his own subjects resolved to atone for it to the god of mercy by carrying sword and fire to destroy thousands of his fellow-creatures who had neither offended him nor even heard of him his queen whose influence had led to the misdeed at vitry likewise became penitent and as sovereign of aquitaine vowed to accompany her lord to the holy land and lead the forces of the south to the relief of the christian kingdom of jerusalem the wise and excellent abbot suger the chancellor of louis the seventh endeavored to prevail on his royal master to relinquish his mad expedition to syria assuring him that it would bring ruin on his country but the fanaticism of the king was proof against such persuasions moreover the romantic idea of becoming a female crusader had got into the light head of eleonora his queen and being at this time in the very flower of her youth and beauty she swayed the king of france according to her will and pleasure suger gives us the description of the preparations eleonora made for this campaign which were absurd enough to raise the idea that the good statesman was romancing if contemporary historians had not confirmed his evidence when queen eleonora received the cross from saint bernard at vezelay she directly put on the dress of an amazon and her ladies all actuated by the same frenzy mounted on horseback and forming a lightly armed squadron surrounded the queen when she appeared in public calling themselves queen eleonora's bodyguard they practiced amazonian exercises and performed a thousand follies in public to animate their zeal as practical crusaders by the suggestion of their young queen this band of mad women sent their useless distaffs as presents to the knights and nobles who had the good sense to keep out of this insane expedition this ingenious taunt had the effect of shaming many wise men out of their better resolutions and to such a degree was this mania of the crusade carried that as saint bernard himself owns whole villages were deserted by their male inhabitants and the land left to be tilled by women and children such fellow soldiers as queen eleonora and her amazons would have been quite sufficient to disconcert the plans and impede the projects of hannibal himself and though king louis conducted himself with great ability and courage in his difficult enterprise no prudence could counteract the misfortune of being encumbered with an army of fantastic women king louis following the course of the emperor conrad whose army roused by the eloquence of saint bernard had just preceded them sailed up the bosphorus and landed in thrace the freaks of queen eleonora and her female warriors were the cause of all the misfortunes that befell king louis and his army especially in the defeat at laodicea the king had sent forward the queen and her ladies escorted by his choicest troops under the guard of count marien 
he charged them to choose for their camp the arid but commanding ground which gave them a view over the defiles of the valley of laodicea while this detachment was encamping he at the distance of five miles brought up the rear and baggage ever and anon turning to battle bravely with the skirmishing arab cavalry who were harassing his march queen eleanora acted in direct opposition to his rational directions she insisted on her detachment of the army halting in a lovely romantic valley full of verdant grass and gushing fountains the king was encumbered by the immense baggage which william of tyre declares the female warriors of queen eleanora insisted on retaining in the camp at all risks darkness began to fall as the king of france approached the entrance of the valley and to his consternation he found the heights above it unoccupied by the advanced body of his troops finding the queen was not encamped there he was forced to enter the valley in search of her and was soon after attacked from the heights by swarms of arabs who engaged him in the passes among the rocks close to the fatal spot where the emperor conrad and his heavy horse had been discomfited but a few weeks before king louis sorely pressed in one part of this murderous engagement only saved his life by climbing a tree whence he defended himself with the most desperate valor at length by efforts of personal heroism he succeeded in placing himself between the detachment of his ladies and the saracens but it was not till the dawn of day that he discovered his advanced troops encamped in the romantic valley chosen by his poetical queen seven thousand of the flower of french chivalry paid with their lives the penalty of the queen's inexperience in warlike tactics all the provision was cut off the baggage containing the fine array of the lady warriors which had proved such an encumbrance to the king was plundered by the arabs and saracens and the whole army was reduced to great distress fortunately antioch was near whose prince was the uncle of the crusading queen of france prince raymond opened his friendly gates to the distressed warriors of the cross and by the beautiful streams of the orontes the defeated french army rested and refreshed themselves after their recent disasters raymond of poitou was brother to the queen's father the saintly william of poitou there was however nothing of the saint in the disposition of raymond who was still young and was the handsomest man of his time the uncle and the niece who had never met before were much charmed with each other it seemed strange that the man who first awakened the jealousy of king louis should stand in such near relationship to his wife yet it is certain that as soon as queen eleanora had recovered her beauty somewhat sullied by the hardships she endured in the camp she commenced such a series of coquetries with her handsome uncle that king louis greatly scandalized and incensed hurried her out of antioch one night and decamped to jerusalem with slight leave-taking of raymond or none at all it is true many authorities say that raymond's intrigues with his niece were wholly political and that he was persuading his niece to employ her power as duchess of aquitaine for the extension of his dominions and his own private advantage eleanora was enraged by her sudden removal from antioch and entered the holy city in a most indignant mood jerusalem the object of the ardent enthusiasm of every other crusader raised no religious ardor in her breast she was burning with resentment at the unaccustomed harshness king louis exercised toward her in jerusalem king baldwin received eleanora with the honors due both to her rank as queen of france and her power as a sovereign ally of the crusading league but nothing could please her it is not certain whether her uneasiness proceeded from a consciousness of guilt or indignation at being the object of unfounded suspicions but it is indisputable that after her forced departure from antioch all affection between eleanora and her husband was at an end while the emperor of germany and the king of france laid an unsuccessful siege to damascus eleanora was detained at jerusalem in something like personal restraint the great abilities of sultan nureddin rendered this siege unavailing and louis was glad to withdraw with the wreck of his army from asia after many perils at constantinople and detention at sicily the king and queen of france arrived safely in their own dominions eleven forty eight there are letters still extant from suger abbot of st denis 
the minister and confidant of King Louis, by which it appears that the king had made complaints of the criminal attachment of his queen to a young Saracen emir, of great beauty, named Sal Adin. For this misconduct, the king of France expressed his intention of obtaining a divorce immediately, but was dissuaded from this resolution by the suggestions of his sagacious minister, who pointed out to him the troubles which would accrue to France by the relinquishment of the great Provence dower, and that his daughter, the Princess Marie, would be deprived in all probability of her mother's rich inheritance if the queen were at liberty to marry again. This remonstrance so far prevailed on Louis that from the unfortunate crusade Eleonora presided at Paris with all her usual state and dignity as long as Suger lived, about four years. She was, however, closely watched and not permitted to visit her southern dominions, a prohibition which greatly disquieted her. She made many complaints of the gloom of the northern Gaelic capital and the monkish manners of her devout husband. She was particularly indignant at the plain and unostentatious clothing of King Louis, who had likewise displeased her by sacrificing, at the suggestion of the clergy, all his long curls, besides shaving off his beard and mustachio. The giddy queen made a constant mockery of her husband's appearance, and vowed that his smooth face made him look more like a cloistered priest than a valiant king. Thus two years passed away in mutual discontent, till, in the year 1150, Geoffrey Plantagenet, Count of Anjou, appeared at the court of Louis the Seventh. Geoffrey did homage for Normandy, and presented to Louis his son, young Henry Plantagenet, surnamed Fitz Empress. This youth was about seventeen, and was then first seen by Queen Eleonora. But the scandalous chroniclers of the day declare, the queen was much taken by the fine person and literary attainments of Geoffrey, who was considered the most accomplished knight of his time. Geoffrey was a married man, but Queen Eleonora as little regarded the marriage engagements of the persons on whom she bestowed her attention, as she did her own conjugal ties. About eighteen months after the departure of the Agavin princes, the Queen of France gave birth to another princess, named Alice. Soon after this event, Henry Plantagenet once more visited Paris, to do homage for Normandy and Anjou a pleuritic fever having suddenly carried off his father. Queen Eleonora now transferred her former partiality for the father to the son, who had become a noble, martial-looking prince, full of energy, learned, valiant, and enterprising, and ready to undertake any conquest, whether of the heart of the gay queen of the south, or of the kingdom from which he had been unjustly disinherited. Eleonora acted with her usual disgusting levity in the advances she made to this youth. Her beauty was still unimpaired, though her character was in low esteem with the world. Motives of interest induced Henry to feign a return to the passion of Queen Eleonora. His mother's cause was hopeless in England, and Eleonora assured him that if she could effect a divorce from Louis, her ships and treasures should be at his command for the subjugation of King Stephen. The intimacy between Henry and Eleonora soon awakened the displeasure of the King of France, and the prince departed for Anjou. Queen Eleonora immediately made an application for a divorce, under the plea that King Louis was her fourth cousin. It does not appear that he opposed this separation, though it certainly originated from the queen. Notwithstanding the advice of Suger, Louis seems to have accorded heartily with the proposition, and the divorce was finally pronounced, by a council of the church, at Balgancy, March 18, 1152, where the marriage was not dissolved on account of the queen's adultery, as is commonly asserted, but declared invalid because of consanguinity. Eleonora and Louis, with most of their relations, met at Balgancy, and were present when the divorce was pronounced. When the divorce was first agitated, Louis the Seventh tried the experiment of seizing several of the strongholds of Guienne, but found the power of the South was too strong for him. It is useless for modern historians either to blame or praise Louis the Seventh for his scrupulous honesty in restoring to Eleonora her patrimonial dominions. He restored nothing that he was able to keep, excepting her person. 
Gifford, who never wrote a line without the guide of contemporary chronicles, has made it fully apparent that the Queen of the South was a stronger potentate than the King of the North. If the Lady of Ock and No, and the Lord of We and Non, had tried for the mastery, by force of arms, the civilized, the warlike, and maritime Provençal, would certainly have raised the banner of St. George, and the Golden Leopards, far above the Oriflame of France, and rejoiced at having such fair cause of quarrel with their suzerain, as the rescue of their princess. Moreover, Louis could not detain Eleonora, without defying the decree of the Pope. On her way southward to her own country, Eleonora stayed some time at Blois. The count of this province was Thibault, elder brother to King Stephen, one of the handsomest and bravest men of his time. Much captivated with the splendor of the great Provence dower, Thibault offered his hand to his fair guest. He met with a refusal, which by no means turned him from his purpose, as he resolved to detain the lady, a prisoner in his fortress, till she complied with his proposal. Eleonora suspected his design, and departed by night, without the ceremony of leave-taking. She embarked on the lorry, and went down the stream to Tours, which was then belonging to the dominions of Anjou. Here her good luck, or dexterous management, brought her off clear from another maladventure. Young Geoffrey Plantagenet, the next brother to the man she intended to marry, had likewise a great inclination to be sovereign of the South. He placed himself in ambush, at a part of the lorry called the Port of Piles, with the intention of seizing the Duchess and her train, and carrying her off, and marrying her. But, says the chronicler, Eleonora was pre-warned by her good angel, and she suddenly turned down a branch of the stream southwards, towards her own country. Thither Henry Plantagenet, the elder brother of Geoffrey, repaired, to claim the hand which had been promised him months before the divorce. The celerity with which the marriage of Eleonora followed her divorce astonished all Europe, for she gave her hand to Henry Plantagenet, Duke of Normandy and Count of Anjou, only six weeks after the divorce was pronounced. Eleonora is supposed to have been in her thirty-second year, and the bridegroom in his twentieth, a disparity somewhat ominous, in regard to their future matrimonial felicity. The Duchess of Aquitaine and the Duke of Normandy were married at Bordeaux, on May Day, with all the pomp that the luxurious taste of Eleonora, aided by Provençal wealth, could effect. If Henry and Eleonora could have been married a few months earlier, it would have been better for the reputation of the bride, since all chroniclers are very positive in fixing the birth of her eldest son, William, on the 17th of August, 1152, little more than four months after their union, on the 1st of May. The birth of this boy accounts for the haste with which Eleonora was divorced. Had King Louis detained his unfaithful wife, a dispute might have arisen, respecting the succession to the crown of France. This child was born in Normandy, whither Henry conveyed Eleonora directly after their marriage, leaving the garrisons of Aquitaine commanded by Norman officers faithful to his interest, a step which was the commencement of his unpopularity in his wife's dominions. Louis the Seventh was much displeased at the marriage of his divorced queen with Henry of Anjou, he viewed with uneasiness the union of the fair provinces of the south with Anjou and Normandy, and, in order to invalidate it, he actually forbade Henry to marry without his permission, claiming that authority as his feudal lord. His measures, we think, ought to acquit King Louis of the charge of too much righteousness in his political dealings, for which he is blamed by the superficial Voltaire. However, the hostility of Louis, who entered into a league with King Stephen, roused young Henry from the pleasures in which he was spending the first year of his nuptials, and, breaking from his wedded Circe, he obtained, from her fondness, a fleet for the enforcement of his claims to his rightful inheritance. Eleonora was sovereign of a wealthy maritime country, whose ships were equally used for war and commerce. Leaving his wife and son in Normandy, Henry embarked from Harfleur with 36 ships, May 1153. Without the aid of this Provençal fleet, England would never have reckoned the name of Plantagenet among her royal dynasties. 
these circumstances are alluded to with some dry humor in the following lines by robert of gloucester in eleven hundred years of grace and forty-one died geoffrey of plantagenet the earl of anjou henry his son and heir earl was made through all anjou and duke of normand much to his mind to come and win england for he was next of kind and to help his mother who was oft in feeble chance but he was much acquaint with the queen of france some deal too much as we ween so that in something the queen loved him as we trowed more than her lord the king so that it was forth put that the king and she so sibe were that they must no longer together be the kindred was proved so near that king louis there and eleonora his queen by the pope departed were some were glad now as might be truly seen for henry's empress son forthwith espoused the queen the queen riches and now had under her hand which helped henry then to war on england in the eleven hundredth year and fifty-two after god on earth came this spousing was a due the next year after that and henry with his power nom took and with six and thirty ships to england come there is reason to believe that at this period henry seduced the heart and won the affections of the beautiful rosamond clifford under the promise of marriage as the birth of her eldest son corresponds with henry's visit to england at this time for he left england the year before stephen's death eleven fifty three henry was busy laying siege to the castle of one of his rebels in normandy when the news of stephen's death reached him six weeks elapsed before he sailed to take possession of his kingdom his queen and infant son accompanied him they waited a month at barfleur for a favorable wind and after all they had a dangerous passage but landed safely at osterham december eighth the king and queen waited at the port for some days while the fleet dispersed by the wind collected they then went to winchester where they received the homage of the southern barons theobald archbishop of canterbury and some of the chief nobles came to hasten their appearance in london where henry was say the saxon chroniclers received with great honor and worship and blessed to king the sunday before midwinter day eleanor and henry were crowned at westminster abbey december nineteenth eleven fifty four after england to use the words of henry of huntington had been without a king for six weeks henry's security during this interval was owing to the powerful fleet of his queen which commanded the seas between normandy and england and kept all rebels in awe the coronation of the king of england and the luxurious lady of the south was without parallel for magnificence here were seen in profusion mantles of silk and brocade of a new fashion and splendid texture brought by queen eleonora from constantinople in the illuminated portraits of this queen she wears a whipple or close coif with a circlet of gems put over it her kirtle or close gown has tight sleeves and fastens with full gathers just below the throat confined with a rich collar of gems over this is worn the elegant pelisson or outer robe bordered with fur with very full loose sleeves lined with ermine showing gracefully the tight kirtle sleeves beneath the elegant taste of eleonora or perhaps her visit to the greek capital revived the beautiful costume of the wife of the conqueror in some portraits the queen is seen with her hair braided and closely wound round the head with jewelled bands over all was thrown a square of fine lawn or gauze which supplied the place of a veil and were worn precisely like the faziola still the national costume of the lower orders of venice sometimes this coverchief or kerchief was drawn over the features down below the chin it thus supplied the place of veil and bonnet when abroad sometimes it descended but to the brow just as the wearer was disposed to show or conceal her face frequently the coverchief was confined by the bandeau or circlet being placed on the head over it girls before marriage wore their hair in ringlets or tresses on their shoulders the church was very earnest in preaching against the public display of ladies hair after marriage the long hair of the men likewise drew down the constant fulminations of the church 
but after Henry I had cut off his curls, and forbidden long hair at court, his courtiers adopted periwigs. Indeed, if we may judge by the queer effigy on his coins, the handsome Stephen himself wore a wig. Be this as it may, the thunder of the pulpit was instantly leveled at wigs, which were forbidden by a sumptuary law of King Henry. Henry the Second made his appearance, at his coronation, with short hair, mustachios, and shaven chin. He wore a doublet, and short agavin cloak, which immediately gained for him from his subjects, Norman and English, the sobriquet of court mantle. His dalmatica was of the richest brocade, bordered with gold embroidery. At this coronation, ecclesiastics were first seen in England dressed in sumptuous robes of silk and velvet, worked with gold. This was in imitation of the luxury of the Greek church. The splendor of the dresses seen by the queen at Constantinople occasioned the introduction of this corruption in the western church. Such was the costume of the court of Eleonora of Aquitaine, queen of England, in the year of her coronation, 1154. End of section 15